Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jamaica Kincaid and I'm a writer. <laughs> It is an honor and a privilege to speak of Elizabeth Alexander. Uh, two poets on a stage, wow. Uh, When the goddess Demeter lost her beloved daughter to the rapacious greed of the god of death, she embarked on a journey to reclaim and reunite her to their divine and eternal union. As she wandered the earth, no other divinity could reason her out of the desire to find and claim her daughter, which she accurately could see was inextricably part of her own divine self. On one of uh, her most part, part of her adventure, she entered the land of Eleusis and learning that he had a baby son, offered herself up to be his nursemaid. She nursed the baby not with milk, but with ambrosia, the food of the gods, and each night she placed him in a fire that burned in the hearth in an effort to make him immortal. Immortal, Thou, those are the words uh, Elizabeth Alexander uses to transport an, uh, the experience of her people into words that will never die. Elizabeth Alexander herself is all too human though her ancestral lineage is positively Olympus-like. She can trace her lineage from Charlemagne, King John, founders of Virginia. She has been award, twice nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, awarded an Ansfeld Wolf Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, among other luminous awards, and is now the president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the nation's largest supporter of the arts in higher education. But it is her triumphs as a poet, her spectacularly moving memoir about the death of her beloved husband, her Persephone, and her essays, works in which she rescues, retrieves what had been lost and stolen from her and her people, that she feeds ambrosia and bathes in a nightly fire that makes her, to my mind, quite like the legendary deity, deity, deity sorry. In a poem from her collection, Antebellum Dream Book, she writes, Baby. The doctor handed me a parfait dish of melting pink and coffee ice cream and said, congratulations, a girl. This bewildered me. I had not been pregnant, but I kissed the dish and put her in the deep freeze to see if she'd take shape. A poem that seems to hold within it the work of the goddess giving shape and life to what should be and will be. In a poem titled Knowledge, she writes, it wasn't as if we knew nothing before. After all, colored girls must know many things in order to survive. Not only could I sew buttons and hems, but I could make a dress and pantaloons from scratch. I could milk cows, churn butter, feed chickens, clean their coops, wring their nets, pluck and cook them. I cut wood, set fires and boiled water to wash the clothes and sheets, then wrung them dry, and I could read the Bible. Evenings before the fire, my family tired from an ending work and New England cold. They'd close their eyes. My favorite was Song of Songs. They most liked when I read in the beginning. The difficult thing about writing uh, about Elizabeth was I wanted to hear more of her than I could stand my own voice, such as the wonder of poetry. But anyway. But and these two conjunctions, two simple words, one making the word whole, the other setting it apart. These two words so important in spirit to any good writing 
that makes her particular genius comes into flower. And they occur in her memoir of losing her beloved companion, her soulmate, to our common destiny, death. That memoir of life and death, gain and loss, titled The Light of the World, chronicles her grief she experiences at this loss. She writes of their beginnings, their middle. Their end is something new in her vocabulary. His name, Fika, suffuses the account of his sudden absence as if they had really been the light of her world, the light that suddenly went out as if snatched from her out of a fit of jealousy. As I sit alone, she says with these words, I think about how brave he was in so many ways and how brave he was to go into that studio every day with his demons and his angels and labor to them, and labor to them on canvas. No day without a line is the motto from Pliny the Elder, derived from the Greek painter Apelles, the devotions. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world and I'm quoting Shelley here. And that statement remains overwhelmingly true. I take this to mean that a poet is more familiar with the beauty of justice and the rest than the rest of us. And here I'm thinking of the thoughts and writing of the great Elaine Scarry. But true as that may be, no law can make a poet. No law has made Elizabeth Alexander. It is her unique presence and that presence foray into the world that has made her the person we are now honoring today. The, Hut the Hutchins Center recognizes Elizabeth Alexander for her contributions to literature. This is beautiful. <laughs> I just want to look at it. It's beautiful. Um, this is a profound honor. Uh, and before anything, I, I want to say thank you, Jamaica Kincaid, for me uh, to be here with you and to be here with Rita Dove. Uh, without your words, there are no poems of mine and that is really specifically true. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And to receive this honor from the Hutchins Center, which I will irreverently call the house that Skip built, this place that centers black culture, thought, legacy, creativity, and genius at the center of this university is an honor of the greatest order. I cannot take for granted in the Hutchins Center what has been built here, a shining temple of legacy and vision of black diaspora where the world learns from black diaspora and ideas are put into their own orbit. So thank you, Henry Louis Gates, and colleagues and friends and Glenn Hutchins for realizing and endeavoring to build this extraordinary house. To receive an award from this center at Harvard has particular meaning to me, so I want to tell you a couple of stories. My great aunt Caroline Bond Day graduated from Radcliffe in 1930 and was the first black woman to get an advanced degree in anthropology, which she did from this university. In 1932, Harvard published her anthropology thesis titled A Study of Some Negro White Families in the United States, a fundamental work that looked at race mixing in black families. The sole purpose of her research in the field of anthropology, written and researched in the 1920s and the early 1930s, was to refute the mythology that said that through anthropology, you could understand the inferiority 
of black people and others. That was why she did her work. So the archive for that book is here at the Peabody Museum. It's amazing. With photographs of her subjects, among them W.E.B. Du Bois, who had supported her research, was a teacher of hers in Atlanta University before she came to Harvard, because remember then, to be a black person to come to Harvard, you had to have gone to a black institution and received a degree before you could come and start all over again at places like Harvard. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, through Du Bois, who also uh, corresponded with her regarding her work at Radcliffe and Harvard, and some of those letters are at the Peabody as well. Through this work, she became the first black person to formally turn the lens on her own family in turn challenging those perceived inferiorities beyond. I talk about her because I think about that here as truly the early days of African American studies and a piece of the legacy of Du Bois. And so to continue with stories and legacy and place to say where we are, I would be remiss if I did not mention that I am receiving this honor at the university that educated both of my parents Adele Logan Alexander, Radcliffe 59, Clifford Alexander, Harvard 1955, where he made his own bit of history as student body president, first marshal of his class, and Lowell House athlete. He also played on the basketball team, with, so I tell you that to some of you gentlemen, uh, led by our dear friend Tommy Amaker. And from those parents, I learned everything I needed to know. I learned about honesty. I learned about integrity. I learned about loving my people. I learned about serving my people. I learned about holding my people to account. I learned that you cannot believe the hype ever. You can't believe things people say about you. You can't believe the things people say about your people. You can't believe the overhype. I learned from my parents to speak truth to power. I learned that sometimes when you speak truth to power, you don't always know if somebody is listening, but somebody is always listening, and somebody always needs your words. I learned from my parents to be unflaggingly generous. I learned from my parents to be a monster for knowledge, voracious, insatiable, never stop learning and never stop sharing what you learn. I learned from my parents never to be satisfied with being the only one in the room. Never be the only one in the room. And so, all of that has served me well because finally I learned from them that the mightiest word is love. And I have everything to thank them for, but perhaps one small thing I would thank them for is the biggest thing of all, which is that they let me read and read and read and read and taught me to believe that the world was true in books and that everything I could need to know was found there, which I think of as being very much a part of the legacy of W.E.B. Du Bois. So to be given this honor in the name of Dr. Du Bois is extraordinary. In my many years of reading and thinking about Du Bois and teaching Du Bois, because I think what I also want to say, and I know that this means a great deal to skip, the field of African American studies has given me everything I have needed in the academy and in my work now in philanthropy. Two of his phrases have been mantras that I return to. The first, one line, a perfect line of iambic pentameter. I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. And by that, uh, a, a line I, I like to say, no literature, no word, no idea should be unavailable to any of us, and certainly not to a black child growing up. <laughs> du Bois in that line reminds us that culture is and must be and eternally is for everyone. 
Another line that I always carry in my pocket and is actually in my Twitter bio <laughs> is that I call myself, in Du Bois' words, a co-worker in the kingdom of culture. This is how I see myself. This is how I see my community. This is how I see my service. And this is how I see my purpose, co-worker in the kingdom of culture. So finally, um, with, with all of my, my gratitude and all of my, uh, my tremendous uh, uh, honor to be with these extraordinary people, I want to say that what I learn from Du Bois and what he teaches all of us is that the world is round, that black people are mighty everywhere on that globe, <laughs> and that black people and all of us are connected around the globe, and that if we live by our ideas and through our words, then we shall be free. Thank you.